Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. Welcome to Politics Done Right. My name is Egberto Willis. With us today is Dr. Andrew Bard Smokler. PhD, a prize-winning author, former Democratic candidate for Congress in Virginia's very red Shenandoah Valley, former talk show radio host, summa cum laude, graduate of Harvard University, PhD awarded with district distinction in a program specifically created to accommodate his original theory explaining how civilization was developed and a frequent columnist in newspapers around the world. Welcome again, Dr. Schmuckler. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. I'm, well, let, I'm let, eager let, for this conversation. I am as well. Let's start with what we intend to do here. Um, Dr. Schmuckler has a, a series called A Better Human Story. And what we've decided to explore with politics done right, because as you know, we like to enlighten, we like to learn, and we like to exchange ideas. We hope to prick at the brains of Dr. Smuckler and entertain that which he offers. Now, I want to start though, doctor, with, um, with, with, with the beginning of your A Better Human Story on your website. You wrote a book. Uh, the title of the book was The Parable of the Tribes. Tell us that story that you told in the beginning of A Better Human Story, because I found it enlightening but I want it in your words. You know, I haven't, I, I, I'm working on a series now called The Fateful Step. Uh, so The Better Human Story is from 2017. Uh, I keep on trying to create a, a, a framework to lead people into what I feel like I've seen. So I don't know what the story is as I told it, but let me tell a story as I experience it now here in your question. Uh, my world fell apart in 1967, 68. And it wasn't just mine. I mean, there's all kinds of things going on. I could make a little list of how the world blew up, but my world blew up and I, 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 I felt I had to come up with an answer for why is the world so full of, of destruction and torment? You know, we're talking about assassinations, about Soviet tanks in Prague, uh, the Chicago convention, the war in Vietnam, uh, so, uh, I had been an ambitious guy on a conventional path, but I had to come up with an answer to that question before I knew how I, I fit into the world. Is this a, got anything to do with what I tell there? Yes, please continue. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so it, then three, two or three years later, I had a, an answer came to me. I actually felt that something had been shown to me. Let me let me break you right there because remember also within your answer you had a conversation with your brother. So let's continue. Well, I don't know which conversation you be. I've had a oh. lot of conversations <laughs> with my brother. <laughs> He's a very wise man. Well, I mean, where you wanted to exp you were expressing some of what you're saying now. Where you're saying, well, you know what? This has come to me, and it, it was the preamp. It was the precursor to you writing the parable of tribes. Yeah, it, it, in just the course of a few minutes in 1970, I saw something about what had happened to our species. Something that was, that put the, the whole picture into a different light. And I spent years developing this. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, off the top of my head. I don't know how all that happened, but I spent years and I, wrote a 1600 page dissertation. And then I got a grant from Ford to condense that into a normal book. And 14 years later, it came out into the world. And 
what I say that I prove in that was that so it was so important. I felt it was so important to develop this that I sacrificed a lot to get get it done. And I thought it was important because what I prove, I, I just like presenting it in these two statements, right? Uh, these days, because um, I've been working on this for over half a century, and and the other things that I've built around it. One thing I prove is the ugliness we see in human history is not human nature writ large. I claim I have proved it. And the second thing I like to say to indicate why it would be important if it was true that it was proved is that any creature on any planet, anywhere in the cosmos that takes the step that humankind took 10 or 12,000 years ago, the step onto the path of civilization, the fateful step, and the path of civilization means a creature, for the first time in the history of life on Earth, the human creature extricated itself from the niche in which it had evolved biologically. Explain. By inventing its own way of life. And I show that that step, which is unprecedented in the history of life, creates a situation that is also unprecedented. Let me ask you, let me cut you right there. I want to break you right there because I, I don't want to, and this is yours, so I, I really can't break your trend of thought here. That's um, okay. You, you yeah. put me through whatever paces you want. Um, I, I, I want to, I want to uh, qualify that a bit. We have heard of cattle. We have heard of zebras. We have different uh, uh, animals that seem to live some sort of a communal life. We have ants that create mounds and have a hierarchy. We have beehives where uh, we get a queen and it has some sort of an organization within that group. How does that differ from, let's say we create in a society of the sort that we have? Yeah, okay, that, uh, that question gets to a very important point indeed. When I say it extricated itself from the niche in which it evolved biologically, that's, that's the key thing. There is a, a natural order in which these other societies exist. Uh, evolution, which, which produced us, mm -hmm. and which we are part of what life was able to create over three and a half billion years. Right. It's continually creating uh, an order, not just the order of our cell or of our organism, but the way I, I like to put it is the lion and the zebra and the grass are working together to create a perpetual motion machine, even as they devour each other. But when a creature invents its own way of life, a way of life which it wasn't handed down in the genes, I mean, we were cultural animals for a long time, we had language and we had fire and we had tools, but we were still living pretty much continuous with what the uh, primate yeah, and hunting nomads. gathering ancestors. Hunter gatherers, yeah. Yeah, so they, they may have had languages and music and stuff like that, but they were still bands living off of what nature spontaneously provided. It's different when not through the genes, but through the creative intelligence of a creature that's more creatively intelligent than anything else that life had created in three and a half billion years. And that creature starts to figure out, well, these vegetable foods that we've been gathering for hundreds or you know, millennia, we can start to grow as crops. And these animals that we've been hunting in the hunting part of our hunting gathering life, we can gather them into herds that we control inside pens or, or out in the hills or however the, the herders did their thing. This is something new. It's not only a new life form, it's a new kind of life form because it emerges out of the creativity of the creature. And there are no rules in place to govern how it might evolve. And I'll stop there because that we're on the threshold of how a, the anarchy that uh, eventually un inevitably unleashes creates a social evolutionary process 
that's destructive and that people couldn't control. Well, you have an interesting way that you put it in, in your second uh, paper here, and that is that uh, at, at first it seems like you call, you, you call anarchy as being the, the first part, and then that civilization itself actually creates anarchy. I think that's sort of a nebulous concept. Well, let me, let me, let's get, we get there in two, two easy steps. So biological evolution has created all these systems where the, the, the parts are, have been selected uh, over e eons or whatever to work together to maintain uh, the, the viability of the system over time for the long haul. So that's the natural order. That's what uh, evolution works to create by choosing what survives to perpetuate its kind over what doesn't. Uh, Gregory Bateson once said, no creature can win against its, its environment for long. So the, the rough edges get smooth. It's invasive species that are destructive, you know, like that. So there was in the system of life up to that point, a natural order in hey, which well, the well, interaction- say, Could you put your camera, click your camera up a little bit more because you keep getting your head to the top. Oh, there you yeah. go. Great, thank you. That's good. Well, I gotta get it to stay there. Yeah, you got to get it to stay. That that's one thing. <laughs> all right, good. Uh, Let's continue. I'm sorry about that. That's so, all right. So we've got these uh, civilizing societies emerging. They're, how will they interact? They're not governed by the natural order, which all you know, the lion and the zebra and the grass. You know, not like that. And there is no human imposed order because this is a very fragmented system. Wherever, wherever life emerged, I mean, civilization emerged independently, like in the Nile and the Tigris, Euphrates, and uh, four other places around the planet. They always emerge in clusters. And these things are going to have to interact with each other in some way. But what's going to order their interaction? The point is, there's no natural order. There's no human order because it's too fragmented for anybody to be able to say, we, here are the rules that we're going to enforce. It's really just anarchy. And we've seen what happens with anarchy in my lifetime anyway. Explain anarchy to folks who don't understand it. Well, um, there is no order that prevents an actor from doing whatever he can and wants to. So uh, when the, in the 70s and 80s in Lebanon, the, the, the state broke down and there was anarchy and warlords rose to, to control the situation. And then in the 90s, we saw it again in, in Somalia, where the state broke down and there was anarchy. And uh, over a certain period of time, the warlords came to dominate uh, Somalia. That's what happens when there's anarchy. Uh, Thomas Hobbes, a great ph English philosopher of anarchy, said that anarchy inevitably entails a war of all against all. And who do you think is going to prevail in a war of all against all? It's the gangsters. That's, that's how they get to be mob bosses. The stronger one, fit, uh, the fit shall survive, right? The fittest, the survival of the fittest? The surviving well, of the fittest, right? Yes, but not no longer in a situation in which the competition has been molded to uh, provide for um, the perpetuation of the living system. There's not a wholeness to to the, the the survival of the fittest when we're talking about a war of all against all. It, it is not regulated by any kind of order. And so, if the if the spirit if if what prevails you know, human cultures, we're starting to invent our own way, way of life thousands of years ago. You know, we had uh, uh, different kinds of uh, chiefdoms and we had different kinds of kingdoms and all the way up until we end up with tyrants uh, enslaving uh, uh, the many uh, and, and conducting wars to build their empires, which is what we generally see when civilization fully emerges. At each stage along the way, there is this interaction, this war of all against all. And only certain, it's not random which ones are going to prevail. You know, there can be something really beautiful, but if it doesn't allow you to survive in a world where it's not controlled how power is going to be used, 
if all want to live in peace, then all may live in peace. But what happens if all but one wants to live in peace and that one is bent upon predation and expansion? The, the, the options for the, the other tribes are limited. They might yeah. be destroyed. In which case, the, the, you know, we've seen the, you know, even in the Bible, whole cities put to the sword and stuff like that. So uh, if they're destroyed and then the, 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 uh, the imperial power takes over that territory. So the, so the ways of power have spread or maybe they conquer uh, uh, some weaker people and enslave them, absorb them into their power system. Again, the ways of power are spread. Or it could be that the threatened society sees what's happening to its neighbors and it says, we better get out of here. And they go to places where we have still found, they're like the most remote places. Right. Where we, where we, I mean, uh, tribes in the Amazon or, you know, the New Guinea jungles or the Eskimos in the north, places where th something fairly much like hunter-gatherer peoples. Let me stop you a second, because I, I still get a bit, um, you know, it, it's this part interests me a, a, a bit here with regards to societies and independent societies and how we are so different. Uh, as we migrated to different parts of the world, I imagine we all began in Africa somewhere and then there were different migratory paths that took people to different parts of the world. Uh, did society, uh, all these different societies, did they, did they have some commonality? And if they did, does that say that there's something within our genes that breeds that? Well, I, we can, from fossil, I mean, if you're talking about like prehistory. Yeah. Yeah, you're talking about when, uh, as hunter-gatherer people spread. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we all started one place, right? You agree yeah, with and, so, and by, by, by the time we start the path of civilization, we've got people in Oceania, we've got people in Aust Australia, we've got people in the New World. So but were they the civilized planet. at any point before the, the great spread, the, the split or whatever? Well, I, I think the evidence is that the process of emerging out of hunter-gatherer into civilization was something that was starting to happen because it, you know, it happened independently in a, in a half dozen places. And, right. Um, but the, the, the spread of, of uh, uh, after the, the spread of hunter-gatherer peoples, so, you know, there were tribes and uh, of various kinds, and, and you see different kinds of tool making. They probably had different languages. They probably had different rituals, but there weren't, I, you know, there weren't cities. Um, that comes later, and and then, and then there's the spread of certain ways of organizing a society. The, 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 the power of a society in a war of all against all is a function of just about every dimension of a society. How you organize the ec economy, whether you've got good central control that can deploy its forces uh, in a coordinated way, whether they've got the technology, whether they're mounted or unmounted. You're getting so, too excited, doctor. That's what happens. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, this idea actually, you know, it is kind of exciting if it's true that the ugliness we see in his, human history is a result of the anarchy, which is inevitably the consequence of a creature creating civilization. It's not a reflection of human nature that we end up with the, the spirit of the gangster playing a disproportionate role in shaping how civilization develops. And that's the, reason that I, oh, that's the reason that I like to have you on because that is my belief and that's a tenet that I live by. Uh, and that allows me to do what I do, not believing that intrinsic to humanity is evil. Yeah, you know, we are, we were shaped to, to be motivated to do what serves life. Not that that's always a simple thing, but we were shaped to find fulfillment in those things which our ancestors had, uh, had found was conducive to their survival. 
you know, there's a reason why when we're hungry, we eat. And there's a reason why we, uh, we get uh, highly motivated to do what produces children. Uh, there's a reason why we feel fulfilled living in a society which has got goodwill toward men and peace on earth. All of these things are life-serving and we are built to find fulfillment in what has been life-serving and for our ancestors as we got shaped into being who we are. That is profound. Um, now, I, where does that take us? In other words, uh, you, you know, the vision that you've seen, where, where does that take us? Well, I, I, there's more, I, I would like for listeners who find it interesting, to, who would wanna know if I deliver the goods when I say I prove those two statements, you know, if that doesn't interest them, oh, well, you know, then you know, there's no point in looking further. But if you would want to know, I hope that we can tell them where to, where to find these ideas uh, uh, laid out. We'll be right back with Andrew Smutler in a bit. Politics done right depends on you to keep doing what we do. What do we do? We make sure to keep, number one, the internet seeded with blogs and information to counter the right and to present what progressives represent for the benefit of us all to everybody so that it's not misread, misled by any other entity. We make sure and populate that internet with blogs, with videos, with all these other things to make sure that we are informed and to counter everything that you normally hear that, that are lying at the right. We also make sure to create articles in, in magazines, articles in newspapers, all around the country to ensure again that our message gets out there last but not least we also write books as you see it class warfare the only re resort to right-wing doom how to make america utopia are two of the many books that i've written on these issues so please support us in one of many ways numero uno you can support us at paypal either one time or monthly go to politicsdoneright.com slash paypal you can support us on patreon that is politicsdoneright.com slash patreon patreon is spelled p-a-t-r-e-o-n you can support us by becoming a part of our youtube channel going to politicsdoneright.com slash youtube or you can support us in many other forms that you can find at politicsdoneright.com slash support be sure to visit our store, politicsdoneright.com slash store, and get our books at politicsdoneright.com slash books. All right, we're back with Andrew Schmuckler, also known as Andy, Dr. Andy Schmuckler. The platform is yours, sir. Well, but, but what I want to say is that if we are better creatures than we have seen ourselves to be because we've looked at the world around us and we've looked at the history of human humanity and it is there's so much ugliness and right now in america oh gosh there's so much ugliness right now it is hard not to feel kind of repelled by much of what we see and yet if we understand how our species got dealt a kind of impossible situation, not because of anything wrong with us, but because we had the creative intelligence to take a step whose implications weren't clear at the time. They didn't know they were unleashing something that had never occurred in the history of life on this planet, but that's what they were doing. But only because they were, and so we can be more compassionate with ourselves understanding we, we were dealt a very difficult hand. We are going to be living on a, in a human civilization which is being shaped by the spirit of the gangster. Imagine, <laughs> and, the, and the war of, it, of all against all. Imagine, you know, if somebody like Putin or Hitler, I mean, think of all the monsters and even in our own, uh, uh, our own world uh, of the last century that we, we, we've seen. How, how is it, that, I mean, we, there aren't that many people who are as monstrous as those. Trump, I mean, he's the worst thing I've ever seen in terms of I've never, at least in these terms, I've never seen any human being who so flagrantly manifests so many fundamental defects. 
<laughs> but, I mean, he, 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 he I, but you know, democracy was supposed to prevent that. So that's a whole other story. I mean, there's a whole other dimension to my, to my thought, which has got to do with how did America come to the point where uh, uh, an American president can be the first guy to refuse to admit that he got beat in a free and fair election. And he foments a coup d'etat, committing crimes right in front of our faces, and be supported by three quarters of the electorate of one of America's major powers. That is a huge phenomenon that just cries out for some kind of explanation. And I have been working on that explanation. Well, you know, well, also, I, I hope within the explanation you point out that we're really not, a, we, we were never really a democracy and our creation didn't want us to be one. And our creation also wanted to maintain a certain group in power. So, I mean, we, we uh, I, I, if I believe what you had to say, I believe that we, uh, we have in fact in, evolved and we also kind of evolved to less evil, if you will. So maybe we go into spurts, but um, yeah, I, I, I think, Trump, I don't know that Trump is in, is much, first of all, I, I, I agree with everything that you've said about Trump, but I don't know if Trump is all that much different uh, from many of our other leaders, just he- Oh, I, I agree about entirely, saying it. but yeah. he epitomizes, he, he right. epitomizes it. Uh, I've, I said about Trump uh, bef when he was just uh, seeking the nomination, that he was the same wolf, but without the sheep's clothing. Exactly, and, exactly. In, in terms of, uh, of democracy, you know, uh, you know, I was a social, you know, I was a, I got radicalized in the late 60s. And, you know, so I, I, I know the critique, you know, I, I focused a lot of energy on the critique. Nonetheless, in the America I grew up in, the America of Truman, Eisenhower, uh, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, uh, all the way up. Well, then about 30 years ago, I saw something was changing. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it is quite fundamental um, what changed. And it, it told me a, a lot more about what forces are at, at work that make the world more broken. Uh, so that's another, that's for another occasion than this one. Here, here uh, I, I wanna talk about uh, uh, the fact that we see a lot of disgusting things but we, the, the point, what I have proved should help us be more compassionate with ourselves and realize that we have the greater capacity to make a more whole world than we would give ourselves credit for. The, and we, we live in a culture, in, we live in a culture in which uh, ideas like original sin and the depravity of man have played a, a, an important role. And, you know, the weight that we carry because of uh, what we think of ourselves, you know, th there are a lot of uh, studies, I think, that show that if you get a teacher to expect well of their students, they do well. Yes. Uh, expectations are important. And I believe I've proved something which should make us feel better about ourselves, have more compassion for ourselves, and, and be, f feel ourselves to be more capable of healing this broken world. Uh, it doesn't have to be this way forever if we're plugged into the wholeness that we've got within. Why don't we start to explore that? Uh, throw me a pitch uh, for batting practice and I'll try to pull it into the left field. Fact. Okay, you, uh, your, your, your claim is that we are better people than we think we are. I agree with that, by the way, that's why you're here. Uh, but how do you uh, express that as being a formula that you found? I mean, I, I will say that it's a formula. I, I'm saying that I think I've lived it. You're saying that you proved it. Two different things. I've yes, lived yeah. it. You have yeah. proved it. Yeah, and I, I haven't just proved it to either. But here, see, what I'm saying is that step by step, I show that any creature on any planet that steps onto the path of, that the path of civil, civil, civilization has inescapable implications. It generates a destructive force inevitably. It doesn't have, it, it doesn't matter what the nature of the creature is. I expect that in other places in, in this vast cosmos, they say there are six billion planets 
in the Milky Way alone. I'm imagining there are a lot of places where some creature or other has started creating some civilization. Uh, and I say that wherever that happens, whatever the nature of that, and I think that I prove that there's no escaping the logic that there will be a selective process out of the war of all against all, which is inevitable, that, go, that mandates that the ways of power, the spirit of the gangster, will predominate in shaping how the civilization evolves. It's not a direction that, that is a, a function of the nature of the creature. It's a function of the anarchy that, that empowers the spirit of the gangster, regardless of the creature. Put that in English. What do you mean by the spirit of the gangster? OK. You've seen the Godfather movies? Yeah. So I make you an, uh, um, well, I, I could call it the spirit of the warlord. I, you know, like, like what I said about the kind of people who come out on top when there's a war of all against all and some are gonna be victors and some are gonna be victims. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not random which ones will prevail. So when it's you say it's not random, what do you mean by it's not random? Okay, I was saying a little while ago, but I don't think I completed the thought that the power of a society and we're talking about the power to prevail in the war of all against all. The power of a society is a function of all kinds of dimensions of the society. So if, if, if a society gets more powerful by a certain political structure or a certain way of raising its children to be fierce warriors or developing iron to replace bronze or developing ways of waging warfare that are strategically more effective, whatever it is, whatever they have done, there, if, if the, whatever helps a society prevail in that war will will have will survive to survive to spread its ways in the human world other ways that might be better might be beautiful but if you can't go up against your neighbor who's who's a tyrant or you know a conqueror or whatever a gangster if you can't survive that you're going to be either wiped out or subordinated or have to retreat, or you're going to have to match the power of your, the, the society that threatens you. And that also spreads the ways of power. So what I say is that power functions as a contaminant. It's contagious. It spreads throughout the system. Inevitably, it is a function of anarchy that the spirit of the gangster, which is that which prevails in the war of all against all, the, 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 you know, the petty hoods all compete with each other to see who's gonna become the medium sized hood. And then there's a, there are turf wars and such. And eventually you end up with, oh, like Vladimir Putin controls everything. Well, interestingly, I think, um, I, I won't disagree with you because I think you've done, uh, you probably have with your thought process points out something that I think a lot of us have figured out that one of the, biggest gangsters on the planet right now is that big C word called capitalism because it's the one system design where it can have a whole lot of folk work and sell their excess labor at a discount, their excess intellect at a discount for folks who are absolutely doing nothing to collect on that, uh, to, to, to enrich themselves on the intellect and, and work of others. If that's well, not gangster, I don't know what is. Well, you know, there is gangster capitalism. Uh, um, and then there's, there's capitalism in, in, in other forms. I've written two books about. Well, wait, wait, let, let, before you go there, because I want to explore that. I, I don't want to give you a pass on that because I'm using, your, I'm using your, your, your terminology here. And I think uh, you, you're, you're, you've, you've really given me that segue to prove what you're saying, and that is, when I when I look at our economic system and who benefits from it and how the benefit is accrued, meaning again, when uh, when those people who own shares, etc., own shares and sit on their butts and other people do the work, uh, I think that is exactly what you could call a gangster type of uh, a gangster type of activity, right? Let me um, let me uh, 
amend that some. Sure. Uh, I think I, I, I want to make a distinction between like the corporate world as, as we have it now, you know, like with the Koch brothers mm -hmm. and the whole fossil fuel industry buying pieces of the government and, and uh, buying whole political parties. You don't know, go to, hey, my friend, don't go too far because you actually, I think you, you uh, you actually laid out a map for me that was like, yeah, oh, I, I get it. But I see, I think that you and I also do differ in a certain way because I distinguish between that and uh, what we'll call the market system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, there is an ideal mm -hmm. um, uh, that yeah, my underst uh, understanding of the essence of capitalism is is the ideology that's put forward by the that founding work of Adam Smith's Adam The Wealth Smith, of yeah. Nation. And my dad was an economist, and I have a lot of respect um, uh, for um, mm, the market properly used. Mm. Um, uh, I, I, I've written two books about what's wrong with the market even properly used. Mm -hmm. um, I critique the market because it has blind spots and it it warps the way a society develops. But it's it's a different set of it's a different critique than the critique you've got, which sounds very uh, Marxian uh, about surplus labor and the exploitation. It's it's I don't see it that way. If uh, what concerns me is that it's necessary to correct for the for the blind spots of the market. And also the, the, the wealth that's created in the market cannot be allowed to buy political power. Those, those are the dangers that are, are involved in, in the market economy. This conversation you, is, gonna write, is gonna last a long time because I see you as a, as a scholar who have actually answered the question for real, but who like many other people in your position discount their own answers because of a ideological bent. In other words, what I'm trying to say is um, you have the answers. You said it. And, and not only have you said it, I think you, when you tell me that you proved it, I think you really have. And, uh, and, and, uh, but there, there, there's usually a pushback I find with Americans, even American economists, et cetera, that after they've gone through all that indoctrination of, about their system and you know yours as, as a scholar comes out and see the answer, you then say, yeah, but exception. Egberto, yeah, no, it's not, it's not that. It's, it's looking at the ideal of the system, mm -hmm. which needs to be uh, maintained, uh, which is you know, fair competition, nobody has market power, stuff like that. It, 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 there's a distinction between that and what happens when, because uh, even that creates problems. But nonetheless, if you look at the world, you look around the world and you say, what are the most decent societies? Um, I would say the most decent societies in the history of the world all make use of the market. I mean, it's true in Sweden, it's true in Denmark, it's true in Switzerland. I mean, a lot of, you know, you, you look around to find something better. And that is I've, the argument I hear a lot. That is well, the argument I, I hear a lot. I think what, what it shows is that a, a society in which um, the governmental power is not been so corrupted by the plutocracy, the money power, Mm -hmm. that is unable to function on behalf of the, the, the whole system. But what we have in America, and we didn't always have it quite so bad like when I was growing up, but we've got a, um, uh, a political system in which the force of greed is enormously powerful. Mm -hmm. The force of the people has been subordinated to a much greater extent than was true, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming out of uh, uh, the New Deal and and all the way. Uh, well, this series is going to be long. This series is going to be long, and you know why it's going to be long? Because I've, I, I think uh, we are going to have a very good conversation on on the market that I think is going to take more than the, uh, that. Going to take several hours of conversation because. I'm happy to be, let me just say, the two books that I've written, 
-hmm. on it. One is published by SUNY Press, mm -hmm. which is called uh, The Illusion of Choice, mm -hmm. How the Market Economy Shapes Our Destiny. Mm -hmm. And I make the case for how it's necessary to control the market more than, uh, you know, more than we Americans are, are generally able to do because of the uh, power of the plutocracy, the corporate system. And the second book uh, published by Harper, uh, whatever they were at that time, <laughs> Harper yeah. San Francisco, I think it was, is called Fool's Gold, The Fate of Values in a World of Goods. And it talks about how the, the way the market attends to that which can be bought and sold warps the uh, society's concept of the good. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, interestingly, um, and, and again, uh, people have to, I think, Folks have to look at things from different different avenues. You know, I mean, I noticed that um, when you talk about all the economies that all the countries that have worked successfully, which I've spoken about, Bernie Sanders has spoken about the, the countries like Sweden and Norway and all these guys, right? Uh, we have a new view of them with their democratic socialist type of being that sort of regulates the market strong, the market, I actually call it a mythical market, but that's for another day. Uh, how they regulate the the market in in a certain certain fashion, mm -hmm. but what there there are certain things that I think and and I think this would be left for another discussion when the market comes up again that we don't take into account right all these countries that you've spoken about right um, have actually pilfered other countries to build up their riches right yeah that, I I I no I no no I, 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 I need to finish I, I this part okay. I need to finish this sentiment I need to finish right. this sentiment sorry um, about that. Yeah, and and the reason I, I want is because so that the next analysis that we do, I'd like that to that to that to be in the thought process of you explaining certain things to our audience. Okay, but, so um, I, I, let me can I respond to that? Yes, yes, sir. I I um I had this thesis that was gonna gonna rule my life mm -hmm. about how power has corrupted the evolution of civilization. So mm -hmm. I had every motivation to find in the Marxian idea about uh, the importance of the imperialistic dimension to uh, Western capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I looked at it, I, I looked for it. I wanted to be able to develop. And it. that's what and, I'd like to, that, and you, you're, and you would came, actually help us. And I came to the conclusion that it was not a majorly true thing. Uh, I mean, it's certainly true that the Western powers abused their power over a lot of peoples, um, you know, you just, I mean, the Belgians in the Congo, I mean, it's just, a, it's a nightmare what they did. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's disgusting what they did. And, you know, even the better, the better colonists like the British, you know, did a lot of terrible things to, uh, to people just because they had the power to do so. So it, the, the imperialistic thing is, but I see it more as a function of um, the selection for the ways of power. Then, and not the, in the Marxian approach as being, oh, the wealth of the wealthy nations is a function of their, ex it's wealth they've stolen from the poorer peoples that they colonize. I know that argument. I couldn't find a good case for it. <laughs> that, is, that is funny, doctor, but let me, let me, yeah. let me just, you, <laughs> let, let, let me qualify that. No, you can put it in your stand if you want. That, that's fine. We have time. I've lost one of the legs. <laughs> oh, you, oh, my God. You got, oh, no, I got, I got it again. I got, I got We're going to have fun. Here. We're going to have fun because this, is a, this, is a, I think, I think this is a necessary conversation. And let me tell you why, doctor. All right. You're a scholar, done a lot of reading. I'm just an engineer. Okay. And we look at things differently, right? I look at things with ones and zeros and just math. That's it. Nothing else. That's all I believe in. You have all these other things that, that can, that, that you can go by. And I, I enjoy that. But, um, when I, there, there are certain, there are certain things that are, um, that are mathematical and there are certain things that are ideological, cultural, uh, ideological and cultural. And what I find in America a lot of times is that we have a very hard time, especially as we grow older. You ever heard the story that says, as we grow older, we become more conservative. In my case, as we grow older, I became a hell of a lot more liberal and, and activist, but I am usually sort of an exception to a case. But as many grow older, they become more conservative. 
I don't understand why really, but again, I, 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 I love what I read from you and I wanted to use it as a good platform for us to have this conversation and with an open mind on all sides, I hope, but I know, you know mine's always open. You know, I, I really um, respect and appreciate the openness that you show. Cause I, you know, in this conversation about the economy, I've, I've taken a pot shot at a couple of, of things that uh, are not trivial in your, your thinking about things. You know? And you've, and you have responded with, with um, such a, uh, an interest in f seeking the truth. And that's, uh, that's the idea, right, doctor? I mean, think about this. If look, I am not wedded, and that's what I try to explain to folks, right? I, we, are all, we all have an ideology. We all do. But we should not be wedded to an ideology proven wrong. You know, that, that, that's such a... I, I so much appreciate integrity like that. My dad had, had integrity, and uh, I had an experience at Yale when I found out that my dad wasn't typical of all academics. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, the the thing I, I I have had good fortune and bad fortune in my life. Mm -hmm. I've had the bad fortune that I've had a mission to get certain ideas out into the world. And even though I got like a full page review in the New York Times and a prize and stuff like that, I really did not su succeed anything like what I tried to, which is why I'm doing podcasts now. Well, actually, I, I, I think you, uh, you, you, you sell, uh, if you think, let me, let me tell you something, okay? Uh, here, here's an interesting thing. I, before I became a, this, by the way, this, this is live, will be live on air as well. So you're not only a podcast when you're with Politics Done Right at all, you're also on Pacifica Network and several others. So you're, you, 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 you're, you're going to get pretty good people are going to hear your voice as I try to get everybody's voices heard. Well, on the I platforms hope I managed to show something with all these words I've spoken. Well, actually, sir, you have, and uh, it, you've, you've tickled my, and I am pretty sure we, we have, uh, America is a smart country when uh, they're not taken for granted. So, I mean, uh, you know, I, I honestly believe that. Um, I wanted to say in what way, I, one way I've been very fortunate. It, I, I fear that it'll sound like boasting, but it really is gratitude. I could not have asked for more, for the world to have helped me more, become somebody who could speak about these kinds of things. Yeah. I, my, from my, from my, the parents who were teachers, to the schools I went to, I, I just wouldn't know how, to dis, how, how I could have had a better opportunity. And I've just been passionate about taking it as far as I could. And I, I think that is, that is great, sir, because like, I, I, say, I say similar things as well. I'm fortunate that I have a platform. I'm fortunate that I went from an engineer to a radio show host. I'm fortunate that I, I am able to understand these concepts, even having not gone to Harvard University and studied economics and all these other things. I did it all reading, right? But, um, but, but here's the interesting thing that I, that I want to go on, and this is gonna go into our next program. Uh, I'd like our next program to cover, uh, you know, continue to be a continuation of this because this is a very, very interesting conversation. Um, I think, like I mentioned, I, the, the last statement I made was that um, we all have ideologies, but we should not be wedded to them. Right, right. And the reason we shouldn't be wedded to them is you may enlighten me to something. And I hope that I, if I, if some of the way, things that I think about may enlighten you, I mean, you never know. But um, when it comes to what I find is that you have come out with some solutions to talk about the goodness of people. But most importantly, in this conversation, you've talked about the person who usually wins is the gangster, right? And you're right. Unfortunately, you're right, because we the people have still learned to follow gangster. I wrote a blog post the other day and said, one of the interesting things that we do is we have a way of following psychopaths, okay? I equate the gangster to the psychopath. In other words, a person it's, who does definitely a component. It's right. Definitely a component. So, so I agree with, with what you had to say there wholeheartedly. Now, um, 
what I'd like to consider for our um, next program, it's amazing when you're having fun, how fast time goes, right? <laughs> uh, because that, that we're having, but I'd, I'd like us to examine a continuation of where we're going, where you brought up the, the fact that gangsters is, um, you know, that we, we ultimately get ruled by gangsters and they're the ones who win. Because I think uh, that point that you've stated there is proven with America, it's proven with Trump, it's proven throughout not only the Western world, but we can go country after country. And then I would like to use what you've said about most people being good and that we were the only species able to evolve as we did. How do we mitigate that? Well, I, I, if I, to, to lay out a little bit more of the table, let me say a, a couple of things. Yes. One, one is, uh, I think that I prove that any, that any civilization creator, creating creature like mm -hmm. ourselves mm -hmm. has as its central challenge to order its civilization well enough, soon enough, that it doesn't destroy itself first. Okay. That, is a, that is where we stay. That is where we start on the second. I love, I love that segue, sir. And let, if I can put one more thing on the, uh, uh, I call this my integrative vision, you know, the, the pieces I've tried to put together. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's one that I call a secular understanding of the, ba the battle between good and evil. And I think that I can show in a good social scientific way, like having studied the flow of, of forces in history, I can show that a central part of the human drama are two coherent forces battling each other to, for, to see which will shape the human future, the human world. One is being a coherent force that can consistently spreads a pattern of wholeness and another a, a coherent force that consistently spreads a, a, a a pattern of brokenness and that we in America are now getting a very good view of the battle between good and evil. Dr. Andrew Schmuckler, thank you so kindly for the first episode of what will be a continuing, uh, a continuing discussion on a better human story. Thank you so kindly. Thank you so much too. Kudos to Indivisible Houston. They got the job done. Uh, Benjamin Hernandez uh, did a great job in really cornering, exposing Ted Cruz. And you know what's the best part about it? They finally get a national recognition. And not only that, but their act gave the marching orders to the rest of the country. Ezra, let me bring you into this conversation. The Senate, in my view, ridiculously is on vacation right now, but a small bipartisan group of senators is meeting to discuss whether they can reach consensus on very basic, very limited uh, set of policies to address gun violence, including an expansion of background checks. How confident are you that they will get it done? I'm not confident we're talking about the Senate here, but just because I'm not confident doesn't mean that it's impossible. We know that because of Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, we can't get rid of the Phil. Buster. They've refused to join with the other Democrats to do that. That means you need 10 Republicans on board. So am I saying that we need Mitch McConnell to do us a favor? No, Mitch McConnell is not going to do us a favor. The Republicans in the Senate are not going to do us a favor. But what we do know is that Mitch McConnell and the Republicans move when they perceive some amount of political threat, when they think, oh, if I don't back down, I am going to suffer politically. And so what our job is in this moment, I'm not talking about Democratic senators. I'm not talking about the president. I'm talking about all of us, all of us watching in this moment. Our job is to change the political calculus of those Republican senators. That means joining up with March for Our Lives on June 11th on protests all across the country. And it means taking a, a, a cue from the folks in Indivisible Houston, down in Houston, who found Ted Cruz in a restaurant and said, hey, why are you against common sense? gun violence prevention laws, get behind us in this. We so, need everybody, whether you've got a Democrat or a Republican, getting involved in this moment and changing what's politically possible. 
So you mentioned, uh, Ezra, the, uh, the Ted Cruz incident. We have tape of that. That was an activist uh, from your group confronting Senator Ted Cruz right after we attended the NRA convention that took place three days after the shooting in Uvalde. Let's have a look at that clip, and then I'll, I'll get your reaction on the other side. Ezra, we're not aware of any public response from Ted Cruz to that clip or incident yet. But I have to ask, as much as I enjoy watching that, and I'm sure many people at home think, yes, that is the thing to do. Can you really shame people who have no shame? Oh, no, you can't shame Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz is probably going to fly over to Cancun next week. I'm sure that's what he likes to do. The point here isn't to shame Ted Cruz. The point here is to make it very, very clear to everybody watching, not just folks watching us right now, but everybody at home watching who uh, is not a partisan on this issue, isn't a, you know, a Republican or a Democrat or an independent. They just want common sense gun laws. And they are watching interactions like this between Ted Cruz and his constituents, where Ted Cruz says, you don't know what you're talking about. We need to face a reality in this country that there is a marginal, radical, MAGA extremist faction of the Republican Party that is controlling policy for the entire nation. They are a radical, dangerous minority. We are the normal yes. majority. And if we well, take the fight to them, and this is on guns, this is on abortion, this is on contraception, this is on teachers, this is on schools, this is on our democracy. We are in the majority, yes. they are in the minority. And if we well, take the fight to them, it makes it more difficult for them to prevent us from doing popular things. Absolutely so. We have to take the fight to them. And that is what was great about what Benjamin Hernandez did with, uh, with uh, uh, Indivisible Houston. He took it to them and he showed the rest of the country how it is done so that America can see the fraud that they are. And once America see the fraud that they are, then... You can listen and or watch Politics Done Right Mondays through Fridays on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash politics done right or on YouTube Live at politics done right dot com slash YouTube. Please do not forget to follow me on Twitter for updates. My Twitter handle is at Egberto Willies. Politics Done Right depends on you to keep doing what we do. What do we do? We make sure to keep, number one, the internet seated with blogs and information to counter the right and to present what progressives represent for the be benefit of us all to everybody so that it's not misread, misled by any other entity. We make sure and populate that internet with blogs, with videos, with all these other things to make sure that we are informed and to counter everything that you normally hear that, that are lying at the right. We also make sure to create articles in, in magazines, articles in newspapers all around the country to ensure, again, that our message gets out there. Last but not least, we also write books. As you see it, Class Warfare, the only re resort to right-wing doom, How to Make America Utopia, are two of the many books that I've written on these issues. So please support us in one of many ways. Numero uno, you can support us at PayPal, either one time or monthly, go to politicsdoneright.com slash PayPal. You can support us on Patreon. That is politicsdoneright.com slash Patreon. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You can support us by becoming a part of our YouTube channel, going to politicsdoneright.com slash YouTube, or you can support us in many other forms that you can find at politicsdoneright.com slash support. Be sure to visit our store, politicsdoneright.com slash store, and get our books at politicsdoneright.com slash 
books. Well, folks, that's it for today. You know how I'm going to end this baby. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this baby. I am what? Out! <laughs>